Hey everyone, what's the crack and welcome to the world's first sim racing buyer's guide that doesn't mention a single product, doesn't have a single affiliate link and answers pretty much all of your questions as a consumer. Let's do this. So this buyer's guide is a lot different to a lot of my videos. My videos concentrate largely on hardware and as you can see in the background, absolutely no hardware, not mentioning any brands in this and there are no affiliate links below. So don't worry about any of that. If you really do want to support, you'll find out how to. Before we get started though, I want to establish a couple of ground rules for buying sim racing hardware. Number one, please never, ever, ever go into debt for sim racing hardware. Never, never stretch beyond your means. This is a pure luxury you know, sim sport that we're doing. Never put yourself under massive financial pressure. It's not worth missing rent payments, upsetting family members, anything like that. Please, very, very important information. The reason I stress that so much is because you can have as much fun with a basic setup as you can with a high-end setup. And I mean, you can have as much fun for a couple of hundred euro as you can for several million. If you ask a lot of sim racers, some of the most fun they've ever had was in the past with inferior hardware. So please keep that in mind. Hardware upgrades make you happy from an immersion point of view, consistency point of view, but they may not necessarily improve your racing experience and they may not give you the rewards that you're expecting. So please be realistic. And that's exactly what this guide is all about. This is supposed to be a realistic tool set for you to make the right decisions. There's so much information out there. There's so many products out there and there's so many opinions out there. What I'm trying to give you here is a widely accepted kind of factual information. And my main goal here is to equip you with all the tools that you need to recognize what do you need in a set of pedals or a steering wheel, what's important to you, not necessarily what's something that someone else likes. And I'm trying to give you all the widely accepted factual things about sim racing that I've gathered over the years. But this is where everybody watching this video comes into it. This is not just me talking about sim racing hardware. I want all of you, especially if you're looking to upgrade your sim racing hardware, look in the comments below. Every single opinion in sim racing is very, very important. And some people who comment here put a lot of effort into their comments. So please give them the exact same weight as what you're giving me by watching this video. Some people have excellent advice to give and they're bound to pick up on the things that I miss out on. So value that information. Don't just worship what somebody is saying and say this is the way that we should you know, have our rigs and we should all spend 10,000 euro on a rig. Just ignore that nonsense. Get involved with communities, do some DIY, learn as you go along, take the cheapest route towards upgrade. And often, and this is very, very important, Often that just means spending some time with your settings. Not enough people spend time with their settings. They might buy a new piece of hardware and then invest hours setting that piece of hardware up when realistically they could have just invested those hours and saved a lot of money to make their existing setup a little bit better. Anyway, all that aside, we're gonna go straight into the first category. The first category is pedals and pedals are arguably the most important piece of sim racing hardware that you're likely to need. If you already have a basic setup, the first thing you're gonna upgrade is your pedals. Pedals come in many shapes and sizes, but it is widely accepted that a load cell pedal set is the best for sim racing. Now, load cell pedal set in itself doesn't really re mean much without an elastomer stack. So they're like little rubber things that are behind the pedal. So as you press that pedal, your foot has a kind of a varying amount of force that you're putting on that pedal. The reason that's important is because if that force isn't there, if it's just a linear spring, if that force isn't there, you don't know exactly how much more or less you're putting on that brake. The important part then is you don't know when you get back, you know, when your foot is off the pedal, you don't know how to get back to that exact point. Our brains are very good at measuring the amount of force that we put on a pedal. Our brains are just not good at measuring distance. They're very good at measuring force. So inadvertently, I've already given my first piece of advice, and that is that your throttle and clutch on a sim racing pedal set are not that important. The most important pedal is that brake. The reason your brake is so important is because when you go into a corner 
or when you're just before a corner, you need to lose as much speed as quickly and efficiently as possible without upsetting the balance of the car. You also sometimes mid-corner need to brake. Throttle application is very important and more high-end pedals do give you slightly more feel in the pedal, but a basic pedal spring mod will give you all you need in a throttle pedal as far as I'm concerned. The brake is much more complicated and that's why when you buy a high-end pedal set, generally you're buying the design of the brake. So what you want to do is buy a pedal set that's adjustable to your needs. Some pedal sets don't have an adjustable throttle, adjustable clutch, so you can't adjust the throw on them. I find this a bit of an issue sometimes because during longer stints, especially if the throttle goes very, very far and you spend a lot of time at full throttle, you tend to get a little bit of a pain in your shins from pushing very, very far away. So that's something that's worth considering, but it's also something that's quite easy to mod and then you can adjust it with the software in game. You can say that this is actually 100% your throttle, not, you know, not this. The reason you need a mod is so that you get that hard stop because otherwise you're just kind of floating in space and the same thing happens. Another very important thing to note is that generally with entry level pedals you get a far more of an angle in those pedals. The reason being that they're generally built to accommodate a desk setup. As you get higher end those pedals get more 90 degrees. So if you're in a formula seating position generally you'd be pushing forward with your leg rather than pushing down when you're sitting at a desk. In a GT seating position, you generally have that kind of almost 90 degree as well. And a lot of rigs nowadays have adjustable pedal plates which allow you to compensate for that angle if you're on a fixed rig, but I'll cover those in more detail in the next section. So back to the brake, and this is a personal opinion. This is not necessarily something that is fact. This is just my opinion. I feel that having more elastomers on your brake, so more of those little rubber pieces, generally gives a better feel in the brake than if you have a single elastomer. That is just my opinion, that is not a widely accepted thing, that is my opinion from having used lots of this hardware. So I would recommend to a friend, if there's a pedal set that I've never used, and I see that it has lots of elastomers as opposed to one, generally the one with lots of elastomers is the one that I will tell people to go for. Other things that make less of a difference with a pedal set are things like the height of the pedals, you know, the pedal faces, how high you can put those. I generally don't adjust these. Sometimes you can move them left and right, and even the pedal spacing, a lot of people love the idea of moving pedal spacing, but generally people don't ever do that. They never actually make those changes. When it comes to heel toe though, if you have two tiny little pedal faces, it can be quite difficult. You might wanna move your pedals very close together, but in general, they're larger pedal faces and your throttle, the longer your throttle, the easier it is to do heel toe. So that's something that's worth considering as well. Finally in pedals, the clutch is not that important in sim racing. Most sims don't simulate the clutch properly. That's our first thing, maybe some will in the future, but clutches are a dying art form really. H pattern is a dying art form, which I will cover at a later stage, but lots of you still want it on your sim. The fact of the matter is that all you're buying with an expensive clutch is immersion, not necessarily ability in game. Now, there are caveats to that. A heavier clutch, like the brake, will allow you to memorize a bite point potentially, and some clutches do simulate that bite point, so you can tune that in. The only issue is that that bite point is different for pretty much every car, depending on how you launch. If you only drive one car series on one sim all the time, you can, in theory, tune your pedals to within millimeters of what that thing does in real life. But realistically, sim racers don't just stick to one sim and one car all the time. So tuning it that finely, it's not something that I find realistic and it's not something that I look for in a pedal set. So the clutch, not really that important. If you generally drive Formula One or GT style cars, I would actually recommend not buying a clutch, especially if it's a higher end pedal set and the clutch costs like 200 euro, spend that on clutch paddles. I'll get into those in more detail later. Clutch paddles, far better investment than a clutch on your foot pedals. The next section is your rig and it is the next upgrade. Now some of these sections are kind of in the chronological order of where you need to upgrade. So if you have a basic setup and you've upgraded your pedals, your next thing to look into is a rig. So I'm in a desk chair right now. A fixed rig means that you can't do this with your chair. It means you can't go forward and backward with your chair. It means your chair is in a fixed position. A fixed rig doesn't necessarily mean spending a thousand euro on a rig. 
it can mean just having supports on your seat so that your seat doesn't move as much as it does. The reason you don't want your seat moving a lot is because when you're going through a corner, if your seat also moves and you're compensating for that, you are inadvertently using your hands to compensate. That means you're introducing steering angle while you're doing that, or you're, you might be just messing up your steering slightly. The more rigid your rig is, the less you have to think about and the less you have to compensate for as you're driving. The first port to call is a strong desk or a wheel stand or something to even just secure your pedals in place. There are really cheap ways to do this. You can use some wood, some two by fours or whatever just to keep stuff in place. You can even put a shoe under the caster wheels of your desk chair to prevent it from rolling. Ultimately, the main thing that you're looking for in any rig is rigidity. Now don't get too hung up on rigidity. I know that's completely contradictory to what I just said, but if something visually flexes while it's being used, it doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's terrible. From my experience, yes, of course, in an ideal world, you want zero flex, but realistically, the impact that it has on your driving depends on where the flex is and how the flex manifests itself when you're using the thing. When you video something and a monitor is moving, that's completely different to when you're actually driving and you're in the middle of it, you don't notice that monitor moving as much. So if you're using a monitor stand and there's flex in it, but you don't notice it while driving, you don't need to upgrade that. Same thing when if you have a pedal tray and your pedals are on it, and you can, you can brake consistently with your pedals, but there's flex in it and you can see visual flex, you don't need to upgrade it unless it's an actual issue. Now you might gain slightly in the long run, but is it really worth the upgrade? And one of the things that I'm big on is that kind of diminishing returns point where it doesn't really make sense to spend more money for the amount of reward you're going to get. So throughout sim racing, everybody is just completely hung up on flex in quick releases, in steering wheels, in seats. It just, it doesn't matter as much as people claim. Now again, people are gonna disagree with me in the comments because every flex is different. If you have a seat and it moves like this as you're racing, that is horrible flex. You really don't want that. You don't wanna press the brake and push your seat back. That's bad flex. But if there's a slight flex in fiberglass, like all fiberglass seats, flex a little bit. If you video your seat, even your seat that you think doesn't flex, and you video that while you're sim racing, there's flex in it. That is just the way the world works. It's generally not worth not having any flex in that because it doesn't give you anything extra. So please don't get too hung up on flex. What you do want in a rig is sufficient amounts of adjustment so that you can adjust your height, adjust your distances because the distance between the wheel and pedals is different for everybody. You want to make sure that even if your pedal plate is compatible with your pedals that you can still maybe if you're taller, if you're shorter, you, you still want to be able to get that little bit of adjustment so that you can have a comfortable driving position. The last thing you want to do is learn to be a sim racer in an uncomfortable position because it will teach you bad habits. You need to be comfortable while you're sim racing and that's the main reason for a rig. As for a seat, and I already mentioned it briefly, but don't worry too much about your seat. If you're buying a rig and spending a fortune on it and you don't really care what your seat looks like, buy a second-hand seat. Go on, even better, if you want a second-hand bucket seat, rally cars and you know things that need to be certified, they go out of date. They come up for sale second-hand relatively cheap. You don't need an FIA certified fireproof sim racing seat. You just don't. You know, go to a scrapyard, buy a seat out of a car for, I don't know, sometimes you're allowed to take them away for free. Pay them 10 euro, 50 euro, whatever. Get a nice seat. A lot of people on their sim rigs even have the built-in electronics all hooked up and they've got the most comfortable seat going. So don't get hung up on buying a 600 euro bucket seat when you just don't need to. Next up and probably one of the most exciting upgrades that you can do in sim racing is your wheelbase. Now a lot of people get completely hung up on this and go for this as their first upgrade. See the earlier section, upgrade your pedals first, upgrade your rig, only then 
think about upgrading your wheelbase. When it comes to wheelbases, there are a couple of different types of wheelbase out there. There are the entry level gear driven ones, there are belt driven ones, there are even like hybrid gear and belt driven ones. But most people these days, especially if they're upgrading, are going to direct drive. Basically, all that means is that the motor is directly attached to the steering column and you get as much of those forces as possible. There are no belts or gears or anything in between that, you're just directly attached onto the motor. So when we talk about steering wheels, we are constantly talking about Newton meters of force, which is the torque, the amount of power that goes through the steering wheel to give you that force feedback. This amount of force does matter when it comes to feeling the little details, but as you get higher up, that amount it's again that diminishing returns thing that I was saying. The sweet spot when it comes to Newton meters of torque is probably around 12 or 13 Newton meters for me. If you have a different opinion, again, in the comments below, please give your opinions. But 12 to 13 Newton meters, and I've used everything up to 27 Newton meters. I've used lots and lots of wheelbases. So I think that that is probably where you start, you know, um, kind of flexing the, you know, the amount you can spend as opposed to the amount you get and uh, that's <laughs> the cat so again just a reminder that if you skip straight to this section i'm there's the cat again what are you doing cat if you skip straight to this section uh, i'm not mentioning any brands there are no affiliate links anything like that that is not the purpose of this video the purpose of this video is to just tell you objectively what are you looking for in a steering wheel base number one of course, is how happy are people with this wheelbase? If people are saying, oh, this breaks, this is unreliable, quality control this, blah, 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 that is generally, they're all kind of red flags. Uh, things like flex in a quick release can be, but they are not always because a little bit of flex, if you go into any real race car and start hanging on that steering wheel, you'll realize pretty much everything flexes. So don't get too hung up on that flex, but if while you're steering, it impacts the amount that you can steer and stuff, that is a big red flag and reviewers will point this out. When I review hardware, I always try to just focus on how it feels, how good is it for me to drive with, how easy is it for me to adjust settings, little things like that. I don't like getting lost in spec sheets. And when it comes to wheelbases, spec sheets are the devil. You can get so lost in it because you can say, oh, this encoder is so much more, but really it means, it doesn't mean as much as people think it does because I've used a lot of wheelbases and I definitely, I wouldn't put any amount of money on it that I can tell the difference in a blind test between most high-end wheelbases. It's just not possible. If someone says, well, this is a low powered and this is a high powered, can you tell the difference? Of course I can. It, this is a cheap, this is an expensive, generally, yes. But when it comes to the higher end stuff, telling those differences, it all comes down to personal opinion, the settings that you're using, it gets very, very complicated. And the fact of the matter is, and this is very, very important, when you get to high end products, the differences are minute. You should probably never upgrade from high end to high end. You will only really get your value if you go from a medium to high or a low to medium. You will only really get those massive jumps that you're looking for if you do that. Unless you specifically, you know, you've used your friend's pedals, they feel a lot better, they're the same price as the ones you already have and you feel like a change, by all means do it. You're gonna get great money for your secondhand equipment, but don't look at spec sheets and say, this is gonna change my life because it just doesn't. And anybody who tells you that it does is, I don't know, maybe easily influenced by those specs, but I've so often, even though I pay a lot of attention to those specs, I, I, in my reviews, I don't focus on them because often they let you down massively. When it comes to wheelbases, as I say, the amount of force is a kind of a key indicator. Another one is the slew rate, as people call it. Uh, it is the, basically the amount of time it takes for a wheelbase to get to 100% of its power. And that is an important one, especially, and I'll cover it in a later section, when steering wheels are heavier, larger diameter, you want a good slew rate. So basically in layman's terms, a slew rate is how lively your steering wheel is. How easy is it for that steering wheel to get rotating regardless of how much weight is on it. That's a big thing that people concentrate on 
and for good reason. That slew rate, that ability to get something moving, can make a low powered wheelbase seem like it has far more power. For example, if you have a 10 newton meter wheelbase and a 15 newton meter wheelbase, even though there's 50% of a difference, if the 10 newton meter has a far higher slew rate than the 15 newton meter, it's gonna feel far better. It's gonna translate those details far better as well. So I would love if not only all manufacturers broadcasted what their slew rate is, but also if they were measured by standardized equipment, because generally manufacturers guess their slew rate by just looking at the specs of their motor, power supply, stuff like that. And that is how they come up with those slew rate figures, a little bit like how car manufacturers come up with mile per gallon figures. And it just, it doesn't always translate. So please don't be fooled by specs. So when you're watching a review, look for how the reviewer feels about this hardware. Are they enjoying it? Are they enjoying the driving experience? That is first and foremost, the most important thing. If they're enjoying the driving experience because of the specs, just ignore their reviews. Look at how much they're actually enjoying it and what they say about their enjoyment of the wheel because specs can completely derail you. The final part of the wheelbase that's very, very important to me at least is the quick release. Now most people might not have more than one wheel. If you don't have more than one wheel, you don't even need a quick release. But generally a round rim and a formula style or a GT style rim, it's amazing to have that combo, maybe a large round rim, a smaller formula rim. I Even with a, an entry level steering wheel and base combination, the difference between steering wheels can have a fundamental impact, not only on how much you enjoy and how much you're immersed in your driving, it can actually make you more, it can make you better with that car. It sounds like a very silly thing and it's something that I always dismissed before I did it, but once I did it, once I got my first open wheel rim, it made a massive difference to my driving and my enjoyment. So I would consider having multiple steering wheels and a quick release is a massive part of that. So focus on what reviewers say about quick releases, how easy is the quick release to use, how quick is it, Having flex in your quick release would be similar to having flex in the arm of your brake pedal, for example. It's just not something that you want. If you have some like lateral flex on a steering wheel, you know, where you, if you turn the steering wheel like this, there's a bit of flex. Don't worry about that. You're generally not doing that in a race. But if it comes to, you know, as you're going through a corner, you can feel it deforming, steer clear. A soft quick release like that, you just don't want it. You want something that's pretty rigid. And luckily, most manufacturers offer a really solid quick release experience. The next section is steering wheels. Steering wheels are probably the most desirable part of a rig. When you point at a rig, the thing you're actually pointing at usually is a steering wheel, especially a high end rig. It's the first thing you notice. And it is, yeah, it's just, it's, it, it's a very decorative thing. It's a very, it's the thing that you're touching with your hands with, you know, you've a lot more feeling through your hands than you do through your feet or through your, you know, the seat of your pants or whatever. You're, you're actually touching that thing. So the steering wheel is a very important purchase for most people, especially as you get to the higher end. The number one thing to focus on with steering wheels is the size of a steering wheel. They go from anything like 250 millimeters up to I think 330 mils, even for a you know an open wheel rim. Generally, an open wheel rim would be anywhere between 270 to 300, maybe 310, uh, and then uh, round wheels can be larger or smaller. I have a 260 mil wheel rim. I also have 330 mil wheel rims, so they can vary a lot. In general, you want to be somewhere in the middle. For me, the sweet spot for a formula style rim or a GT style rim is around 290. Um, and the sweet spot for a round rim is probably around 300 or 310. You can drive most things quite easily, quite accurately with those. They're just my opinion. They are not accepted as you know an industry standard or whatever, but sometimes like a large steering wheel, let's say a 330 millimeter steering wheel, it is a lot more difficult to drive, let's say a, a, an open wheeler car with that than it would be with a smaller steering wheel. Um, it's just something that you're, you're gonna notice when you have hands on with them, uh, but 
seeing as we don't all have hands-on with these things, it's just something that I'm trying to get across. Generally, a smaller steering wheel for things that require more accurate input um, is more desirable. If you're doing drifting and stuff, a 330 mil steering wheel is great. Rally 330 is great. Um, as you get smaller, especially with something that's gonna get a lot of sudden forces, like from hitting rocks or whatever, um, a smaller wheel is a little bit more difficult. Now, when you need to feel, you know, curbs and when you need to catch something super quickly, like a slide or whatever, a smaller steering wheel is generally more desirable. There are lots of aspects that make a steering wheel desirable, like the buttons, the shifters, the rotary encoders, the amount of functionality, and a lot of that is very intuitive. Don't get too hung up though on the amount of rotary encoders, because from my experience, even, even though I drive a lot of things, you know, having two, maybe four rotary encoders is usually enough. I mean, we, we all want more always, but you know, don't, don't worry too much about how many buttons it has and that. When you see something, think vi visually in your mind, what would I map these buttons to? That is the most important thing. Make sure that you have the functionality that you need for the way that you already race. Don't go, you know, don't plan for an eventuality of, oh, I might need 2000 buttons. That just doesn't happen. Most people don't use most of the buttons. If you do switch between lots of sims and lots of different cars, it's nice to have different button layouts because it's, sometimes it makes sense to have buttons in different locations. But in general, you'll have similar setups across different sims. Just don't worry about needing so many buttons. Some wheels have extremely clicky shifters. So if the noise is something that's likely to bother you, some people love super clicky shifters that give a real massive click. Some people want that to be a lot more subdued. Uh, some people live with people, so that you don't want that constant clicking. So that's something that's important to find out before you make a purchase, how clicky it is. If you can get an existing owner to send you a video of how does it click, and especially if they have another steering wheel for comparison, can they send you a video of that with the same camera, same microphone as the new one, then you can get a good sense of you know, how clicky is a shifter. For me, in general, even though I live in a house with my wife and kids and that, Clicky shifters hasn't been too much of an issue, but when I do record myself and I look back at the footage and all I hear is that click, I can imagine how it would be annoying. The materials of a steering wheel are also a huge thing. A lot of people are not a fan of plastics, even though a lot of steering wheels have a lot of plastics on them. Uh, most people really like aluminium and aluminium seems to be the high end standard for a lot of products. In practice, it doesn't really make a difference. If something is plastic, it doesn't affect your driving so much. It affects your ego, it affects your, you know, it's like something being a diamond or cut glass. It, it is different, um, it looks different, it feels different, but from a functionality point of view, you don't really need all that aluminium and, you know, uh, billet aluminium or CNC. You just, you just don't really need it. Uh, something pretty basic, even 3D printed stuff is perfectly functional. So don't get too hung up. If you are getting hung up on it, just bear in mind that it's the aesthetics you're hung up on and not necessarily the functionality. Some buttons do have different throws, but most buttons are pretty good. Most buttons these days, and it is the widely accepted industry standard, most buttons are relatively, they've got a, a click, a bit of a click to them and not a lot of travel on them. I do like buttons with a bit of travel on them and some brands do offer that. So just bear in mind if that's something that is important to you, uh, it's something that you can research. Next up is the clutch paddles. I mentioned them earlier when I was talking about the pedals. Clutch paddles are absolutely vital if you do competitive racing and you do standing starts. If you don't do standing starts, don't worry about clutch paddles. Don't even worry about a clutch. Set it to auto clutch, good luck. Just send it. If you do standing starts, clutch paddles, in my communities that I'm in, people consider clutch paddles to be cheating because it, it just gives you such a great launch. What it really does is you have two paddles that represent one clutch. So if you imagine in a car, you press in the clutch, as you want to move the car, you leave that clutch up, it gets to a bite point, and then you leave it out at some stage. What happens with clutch paddles is you can preset, so you do a practice start, and that's why you see a lot of people doing practice starts. They set their bite point with the first paddle. So the first paddle brings you to your bite point. So if, if you imagine I'm holding a steering wheel and it's just horizontal like this. So instead of having it like this, I just have it like that. I'm pressing those clutch paddles. As, I, as the lights go green, I let one paddle go completely. That brings me exactly to my bite, po my bite point. 
the other paddle, all that does is leaves out the rest of that clutch. So full, you usually go on full revs, leave out the clutch paddle, the car starts moving, and then you leave out the next one. That's how clutch paddles work, but they are an absolute godsend. You can, even if you're not great at quality, oftentimes you can get a position or two off the lines if the people in front of you are not very good with their clutch, with their foot clutch, or if they just don't know how to. Now it doesn't work with all cars. Some cars are just, you know, full on and engage the gear and you go. Other cars would spin like crazy if you do that. So clutch paddles are an absolute godsend if you can afford them, buy them. And if you, if you want to sacrifice your foot clutch for clutch paddles on a steering wheel, I would highly recommend it. Unless you're doing rally and drifting, in which case you need that foot clutch. Finally on the steering wheels is the dash. A lot of people obsess, and I mean, I'm one of these people, right? I obsess over the steering wheel having a screen in it. I just think it's amazing. I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's something that's so desirable and it's kind of an end goal for everybody. That's kind of their status symbol. The harsh reality is that um, a steering wheel with a screen in it, unless you're in a like very horizontal formula position, it's not as useful as you would think. It looks amazing, but in general, I would recommend having a standalone dash as well as your normal, your steering wheel. That means you can change steering wheels and just reuse the dash. Uh, it's a lot cheaper and it's generally a lot just nicer. And some of those dashes have height adjustments. So you can actually put that dash in front of your monitor. So it's not on your screen. And it's just like, I would, I would highly recommend that setup. You can buy a dash. You can even build a dash for very, very little money. Um, and uh, I've reviewed a few. Some are expensive, some are very cheap. Uh, Reality is there's not a lot of difference. Obviously when you add LEDs and stuff, the expense adds a little bit, but you can get a beautiful dash and beautiful steering wheel combination for relatively little. Don't worry too much about having that inbuilt screen. Even though I admit, you know, even if I didn't have this channel, I would definitely own one with a screen and I would probably have the confirmation bias to say, oh yeah, I use the screen all the time and it's amazing. The reality is, for me anyway, the reality is having a standalone dash and having a steering wheel without a screen in it is the perfect combo. So just bear that in mind. Finally, and these are kind of the uh, the sundries, the additional things. Uh, shifters, handbrakes, they are lovely to have. A lot of people want them. They have them in their dream sim rig design. Oh, I need a shifter, I need a handbrake. The reality is H pattern is dying. I'm sorry to say it. I absolutely love H pattern. It's the most immersive driving experience on a sim uh, and in real life that you can imagine, but it's just not something that is, you know, I think in sim racing, we really noticed it when the like MX-5 and iRacing changed from H pattern to flappy paddles. It, it really just, I noticed it with that car, um, that sim racing is really kind of, and that real racing, I guess I'm not that involved in real racing, but I see real racing cars, even fairly entry level ones, uh, switching to flappy paddle. And even though it's great, it's quick, you get better lap times, it's not as immersive as having H pattern. Um, so H pattern is probably the first one that people really want. A lot of people like having a standalone sequential shifter, probably for that immersion, for being more realistic or more like, you know, if you do rally, um, it's, it's just a little bit more like what the real car is. The reality is you don't need a standalone sequential shifter. If I did not have a YouTube channel, I probably wouldn't own a standalone sequential shifter. I would probably go for a H pattern shifter that you can also use in sequential. Now there are very few of those on the market um, and that is a pity because they're quite a complex thing and difficult to research and you've got a lot of moving parts, uh, but there are some really good ones, really reliable ones as well. The biggest issue with having a standalone shifter as well as a H pattern shifter is that you start competing for space on your rig. Unless you've one on one side, one on the other, it gets very, very complicated and messy. Add a handbrake into the mix and it gets even more complicated. Pretty much everybody who wants a sim rig, especially if you do rally and stuff, almost everybody wants a handbrake. The reality is most of the time you don't need a handbrake. If you drift, you do need a handbrake, uh, but mounting a handbrake is super complicated. And really, if you're, um, if, you're, if you're looking where to spend your money, I would recommend before you spend a lot of money on a H pattern shifter and a handbrake, really know whether you're going to use them and whether you're, you're actually going to need them because they're a very desirable thing. But before you know it, a handbrake and shifter, you've spent a couple of hundred euro that you could have maybe spent on, you know, those clutch paddles that I spoke about, for example. So it all depends on your style of driving, how you like to drive, but uh, 
Competition for space is a big thing. So those combos, H-pattern and sequential in one, I'm a big fan of those and I want more manufacturers to create lots and lots more of those. I want the shift, the, the, the change between them to be super quick. Um, I don't want to have to undo any screws or bolts or anything. Some, again, some have achieved this perfectly with a little switch or something uh, that you can change between them very, very easily. So that's what I re would recommend. In an ideal world, the handbrake would mount to the shifter as well. Um, so you can have the handbrake on either the outside of the shifter or the inside of the shifter uh, compared to your steering wheel. Uh, so they're all things to consider. Handbrakes are difficult to mount. Uh, shifters, go for a two-in-one combo if you can. So again, to reiterate, um, sequential shifters, you know, a hand shifter is slower than your flappy paddles. If speed is your main concern, just stick to your flappy paddles. Sims don't know the difference between flappy paddles and a standalone sequential shifter, so don't worry about that. Uh, if you want H pattern, I would recommend getting one with the sequential ability in it as well. And if you're getting a handbrake, I would recommend getting one that attaches to a shifter or the shifter that you've chosen. Uh, they would be my main bits of advice. Spaces at a premium, you want them in one place and one place only, and you don't want it just cluttering. You don't want lots of crazy brackets and stuff. So. Um, yeah, that would be my main advice. There are, of course, many, many different things that you can upgrade in sim racing. Monitors would probably be next on my list, but I'm not a monitor reviewer, and I'm not gonna go into detail on that. We've covered the main things. We've covered pedals, wheelbases, steering wheels, and then shifters. The rest is kind of additional stuff. It's not for a generic guide like this. So that video was surprisingly difficult to make without mentioning products. The amount of times that I had to cut out little pieces because I accidentally mentioned a product or so-and-so does it like this, so-and-so does it like that, uh, was very, very difficult. But I kept it generic. Hopefully I've equipped you with a lot of the information that you need to make better consumer decisions. That's the main point of this. It's not to shill any hardware or share affiliate links or anything like that. Of course, I appreciate if you go and find those affiliate links and you go, when you're buying something, you use those affiliate links. And do bear in mind when you're watching other buyer's guides, some of them may be influenced by the fact that the person who is giving you the advice gets a payout. That's why I try to keep as, you know, as, as general an affiliate plan as I can, where I'm not, you know, associated to one brand in particular, where I, uh, advise people to shop around, go through different resellers and different manufacturers, and having those competing affiliate links just means that the community, when they buy something, they can give a portion of that money to this channel. And that's basically the main form of income for the channel. So that's how all that works in case you're wondering. Anyways, for now, I'm Lawrence. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this was useful. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday at nine o'clock UK and Irish time. For now, I'm Lawrence and I'll chat to you later.